talking about exercising faith more or less today, and I don't have a title, so you can you can make up a title for it after I get through. Um, but t talking about faith, the Bible says this in the book of First John, chapter number five. Is everyone there? Everyone have your Bible? I trust that you do. Um, some people nowadays, you know, I used to fuss at people bringing it on a phone, but um, if you're long as you're long as you're looking at the Bible, not your emails, okay, we'll be all right. Okay, yeah, amen. Yeah, we got some folks that uh, it illuminates and they can read it better. I understand that. But I still like something in my hand, don't you? Uh, I like a song book, and I'm 65. I, I, like, I like the old stuff, all right? Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen, all right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Four, first John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then the Bible says in verse 5, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So who's the overcomer? The believer. The, the believer. The believer, the Bible said in verse 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. There is no salvation apart from eternal life. If you don't get saved, then find out it's eternal. When you, when you understand Scripture, you'll know it's eternal. You'll know Jesus is everlasting. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we talk about uh, the record that God gave of His Son. You're holding the record in your hand or in your phone. One, I don't know which one. You're. you're holding the record right here. This is the record. This is the very mind of God. The very record of God in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 19 says to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. God became a man. In Christ, he was reconciling the world. He was bringing the world together into himself. There was something that separated man and God and that was called sin. Not only sin, but the Bible even uses in the book of Galatians the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was taken out of the way and done what? nailed to his cross. So even the law that was against us was taken out of the way, nailed to his cross, sin, iniquities, everything was placed on him. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter number 11, his soul became an offering for sin and God saw, this is what 11 says of Isaiah 53. The Lord saw the travail of Jesus' soul. God saw the travail of Jesus' soul and I love this next three words. And was satisfied. Satisfied. Why in the world can't you be satisfied with what God is satisfied with? I was listening to a fellow preach the other day, and he did a pretty good job. And, uh, and that's what some of you will say. I did a pretty good job till I got to the end. But he did a pretty good job till he got to the end. And in the end, he gave us four ways to go to heaven. He says you got to believe, and then you have to receive, and then you have to repent, and then you have to call. Which one is it? Well, he, the Bible said in John chapter number 1, verse number 12, to as many as what? Received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that what? Believe on his name. So receiving and believing synonymous. Why in the world do you want to confuse people and take them down some road and you say, well, are you preaching repentance? You have to repent before you get saved. You had to change your mind about your lost condition and accept Christ. So repentance is on the opposite side of the coin, isn't it? Opposite side of the coin. So we do believe in repentance. You say, I've had people say, well, you people don't preach repentance over there at Faith Baptist Church. We're the biggest repentance preachers you ever heard in your life. You've got to change your mind. Isn't that? Paul didn't use a word in Philippians chapter number three, but what, have, what happened to Paul before he believed? He changed his mind. He changed his mind. He said, what things were gained, I counted but what? But lost. He counted but dung that he might do what? He might win Christ. And having Christ, of course, he understood what it was to be a saved man because he was saved man. He got saved on the road to Damascus. And he never doubted. He never doubted his, the sufficiency of Christ from that point on. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's what he said. And he said in, uh, what is it, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, I am uh, 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 not persuaded, but... Um, Always confident. Thank you, preacher. Appreciate it. 
I'm always confident. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So not sometimes confident, but always confident. So we talk about this faith in 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 4. And that's just believing God. God has reconciled us. He did make peace. When did Christ make peace with us? On Calvary, the Bible said in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 20, He made peace by the blood of His cross. By the blood of His cross. He shed His blood. He purchased the world with His blood. Now, you have been purchased. Now you need to be regenerated. How are you regenerated? To believe Christ. Believe Christ. I'm not believe any, any Tom, Dick, and Harry, but believe Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, there's another verse concerning faith that you're familiar with in Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6. The Bible said, but without faith it is impossible. Impossible. Impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what he said. Amen. That's, that's what he said. And then Romans 10, 17. Everyone knows that one. So, what, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we get in the Bible and we start examining our faith. I was asked a question just the other day, about three days ago, that prompted this message. And I was, uh, uh, I, th I, I know where I was. I was praying before I went to bed and I got my Bible while I was in the bed. And I opened it to the psalm. I needed some help for myself. And I went over to Psalm 77. Psalm 77. So with all that I said about faith, all the Bible has to say about faith, faith faces difficulties, but faith finds the solutions. Faith faces difficulties, but faith finds a solution. In Psalm 77, the first three verses, the Bible said, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not my soul and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. So the first three verses, we see the cry of God. In verse number two, he said, in the day of my trouble. I think a lot of us can say that even today, can't we? In the day of my trouble. I think Asaph was... Uh, now, by the way, Asaph, if you'll notice the heading of each psalm, that's inspired. That's in the... That's inspired. That's as just inspired as, as verse 1. But it, uh, talking about Judathan there, it's a, he's a praise giver. Asaph is probably the one that David appointed as chief musician. And so he was writing to Asaph. Asaph, Asaph of course, writing to us. Uh, right here in the psalm in verse number 77. But he said, in the day of my trouble. Well, if you'll go back to Psalm 74 and the first three verses, he's probably referring to this particular trouble. He said, O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger, anger uh, smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Remember thy congregation, which thou purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion wherein hast thou hast to well, and so on. You can read the troubles, I think, in Psalm 74 that he was referring to. So he said, in the day of my trouble, in the day of my trouble. And uh, so he began crying out to the Lord right here in verse number 1, 2, and 3. Now we cannot deny, if you read the rest of the psalm, and we will read the rest of it during the course of the message, but we can't deny the conflicting emotions in this psalm. In verse number 1, the psalmist knew that God gave ear. The Bible says in verse 1, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and He gave ear unto me. He was listening. He heard my prayer. He knows uh, my heart. He knows what I'm saying. He knows the desires. He knows the situation. God gave ear. Thank God for that. He that keepeth Israel never slumbers or sleeps. He's always listening. He's wide awake, and He's always on the job. Amen. All right, now we can't deny again the conflicting emotions. The psalmist knew that God gave ear, yet in verse number four, the Bible said that he was so troubled that he could not speak. In verse number four, thou holdest mine eyes waking, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Now thousands, I believe this, thousands upon thousands upon thousands know in their hearts and lives what is written right here in these verses. They've experienced them before. 
Uh, the Bible said man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. If you're not uh, in a trial, you're, you're about ready to go in one. You're either coming out of one or you're ready to go in one. Amen. So trials come on time. They're never early. They're never late. It's how we react. Now, does God know the trial? God knows the trial. He knows the end. So why does God send trials? Not so He can see how you will react, but so you can find out what you're made out of. That's what trials are for. Amen. Trials are good for us. Trials are good for us. So the psalmist was in a trial, and we know that what he's saying, that thousands could actually stand up and testify the same thing. Now, you can ask, and I'm talking about these people that are, that are, that are in a trial, and they're depressed, and they're despondent, and things like that. You can ask about their eternity, and some are as quick as the psalmist in Psalm 77, verse number 15, when he said, Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people. Well, why aren't you acting like a child of God? But they have, a, they, have an, they have a right answer. They have a right answer. You're going through this. Why can't you depend on God? Why do you say you're a super Christian and it seems like that you're fretting over some issues? Let me tell you something. You can ask a person in their lowest state, that, and, and usually the ones that do it think they're a little bit more spiritual. Why aren't you acting like a Christian? Let me tell you something. This psalmist was very quick to tell you who he was. He said, you have redeemed me with your great arm. I know who you are. I know what I know you're listening to me. So the psalmist uh, professes to be a child of God. And brother Caleb in his devotion this morning in Sunday school, he brought out the storm in the boat and he used Mark in Luke chapter number 8 it's also recorded in verse number 22 and following. And now I I believe all the disciples were saved. I believe in Matthew chapter 16 it made it very very clear that uh, when Jesus asked Peter, said, "Who do you say that I am?" He said, "I believe you're the son of God." And uh, the Lord marveled that the Father had revealed it to him. In John chapter number 13, Jesus made a statement, Ye are all washed, except for one, speaking of Judas Iscariot. So I believe the disciples were saved. The apostles were saved in the boat. And, uh, but now they're going through the storm. The Bible said they started out and there was a calm, but in the midst the storm arose and the waves uh, roared and filled the boat and everything else. And, and so ask them. Let's ask them while they're going through the storm. Uh, let's, let's ask them uh, how and when they're going to get to the other side. What do you think their response is? I don't know. I don't know. Now you and I have the Word of God that tells us we're going to get to the other side. It's kind of difficult going through the storms at some thought that goes through your mind and through your life and what you're thinking about you and your family and everything else. It just goes through your life. And some of you are in that situation today. Well, let me tell you, I've got an answer right here and we're going to get to it. But um, in other words, ask, the, ask families that are going through hardships because of this COVID. I have seen more people have to close their doors in businesses. Do you think they're struggling? Do you think they're hurting? Can you see some? I can almost understand a lot of the rebellion going on and, and, and why they're opening despite uh, orders to stay closed. And, you know, we practice. They're letting Walmart open. They're letting Target open, but they'll close that small business. That small business can survive just as good as Walmart can. They can practice social distancing. Just like, Well, I'm saying these things because it's prevalent in today's times. Today, this day. August, August the 2nd, 2020, there's some things going on that I never would, never would dream would have ever went on in our country. There's hardships. There's hardships and struggles. Uh, repossessions and foreclosures are, going, are starting to mount and things like that. Mom and dads have their face in their hands and wondering how in the world they're going to take care of their family. People are hurting all around us. Ask them what their feeling is. Ask them how they're feeling. There's some people that's looking at divorce on the horizon and they're wondering in their mind, can this ever be salvaged? Let me tell you, it can be salvaged. Jesus Christ, you know the answer. And, but, but I'm going to give you some scripture here just in a moment. Right now, we want to look right here in Psalm chapter number uh, 71 in verse number 9. There's another problem that's facing a lot of people today and that's just simply old age. I wonder why I thought of that. <laughs> Psalm chapter 71, verse number 9. The Bible said, Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when thy strength faileth. You, you, there's, you start getting to an age, you wonder who's going to take care of you. I've asked some people that they were, they were really, really 
concerned. I'm not going to use the word worry because you'll say it's a sin. But they were so concerned. Now, the Bible didn't say we didn't worry. The Bible just said we shouldn't worry. Amen. We shouldn't worry. Because Christ is the answer to everything. But people are concerned. So I'll say, well, haven't you got some children? Yeah, but they won't take care of me. Isn't that the, isn't, that's today's ring, isn't it? That's, the kid's not going to take care of you. So the best thing you can do, mom and dad, is go ahead and just put some money up, make sure you have enough uh, to pay your bills when you get older. Which is impossible because everybody's having to shut their business because of COVID. Wow. What is going on in this world today? What's going on? Now I want you to look at the questions that the psalmist had. And you tell me, you tell me just how spiritual he was. If you'll notice, in, and I'm not going to read them all, in seven, uh, verse number 7 through 10 in Psalm 77, look at these questions that the psalmist had. Will the Lord cast us off, cast off forever? The second question, will, will he be favorable no more? The third question, is his mercy clean gone forever? The fourth question, does his promise fail forevermore? The fifth one, hath God forgotten to be gracious? And the sixth question is, hath he in his anger shut up his tender mercies? Sometimes I think, according to verse number three, our spirit sometimes becomes so overwhelmed, we complain within ourselves and we don't see a whole lot of hope. But verse number three says again, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. So sometimes we become so overwhelmed that it doesn't look like a whole lot of hopes ahead of us. So troubled in verse 3 that I cannot speak. He stayed up all night and refused to be comforted there in verse number 2 again. And uh, you say, well, he's just a weak Christian. Be careful. Be careful. These questions are legitimate. And you better be very careful how you throw rocks at people and what you say about people. Because the Bible does tell us in the Proverbs chapter 27, in verse number 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You better be careful. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Well, I know who holds tomorrow. You say, well, I do too. But we're dealing with today. Today, the now, right now. Can I trust him as much today as I know that I can trust him tomorrow? See, I know what the future holds. I know that we're not to sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them will God bring with him. It is his appearing and so on. We'll read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I know these things. I know that during the storm in Luke chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, I know the waves were high, but we learn not to, we're going to have to dip water out of the boat because it's going down, but we don't dip in desperation, we dip in confidence. We know why, because we're going to get to the other side. His command was get in the boat, we're going to the other side. Did they get to the other side? Sure they did. Now I know about tomorrow, but what about today? What about some of the things you're facing today? How are you handling? Well, faith has difficulties. Faith has difficulties, but faith has solutions as well. Amen. Um, Psalm chapter 77, verse number 6, he begins to start thinking. The Bible said in the 77th Psalm, verse 6, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit makes, maketh diligent search. I remember. It's good to remember. It's good to remember some things we're prone to forget. There's a couple of verses I want to take you to. One's in 2 Peter, if you will. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter number 1, in verse 12, Peter said this, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. Though you know The psalmist knew, but the psalmist had some trials that was overwhelming him. And then he had to stop and pause and he had to remember. It's good to rem Peter said, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, 
He said, I want to establish you in the present truth. He said in verse 13, excuse me, yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And then again in 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1, he said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which, unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So sometimes we just need to be reminded of some things that we're so prone to forget. There's another passage of Scripture over in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, <clears throat> excuse me. Isaiah chapter 64. Let me get over there. Isaiah chapter 64 in verse number 5. Thou meetest him with, uh, that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those in whose continuance we shall be saved. Uh, and then it tells us we're all an unclean thing in verse number 6 and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags and we do fade as the leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away and there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou art our potter and we all are the work of thy hands. So the psalmist, I think, in 77 remembered, remembered the good things. In Psalm chapter number 42 and verse number 8, the Bible said, In the night his song shall be with me in my prayer unto the God of my life. It's good to remember. It's good. Maybe some of you here this morning's lost your song, as it were. The, 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 the happiness, the joy, the song of life. You remember in the book of Acts when uh, Peter and, I mean, uh, Paul and Silas in chapter 16 at midnight, what did they do at midnight? <laughs> they, they prayed and sang praises to God. In the midst of the trials, they begin to sing. They begin to sing. So we, 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 we could title the message, Don't Lose Your Song. Amen. I don't know. But that's what happens in Psalm chapter number 77, verse number 2. When you begin to seek the Lord in times of trouble, you will start remembering. You will start remembering the goodness of God. The Bible says over here in... Um, I can't see that clock either, so... Um, some, people, some people get annoyed when I look at the clock and say, Preacher, just preach on. I found this to be true in 35 years of pastoring. If you let people out at 12, they come back. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, uh, in, in um, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, the Bible says this in verse 33 and 34, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So it's good to remember that God's going to take care of me today. God's going to take care of me today. He clothed the fields. He, 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 look what he did to the sparrows. He fed the sparrows. Look, look what he does today, today. Lord, if you can take care of today, why can't I trust you tomorrow? I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. As far as in this life, in this life, this life, I know from, from the age that you begin to make decisions on your own till the day you die, according to Job 14, 1, you're going to face difficulties. You're going to face difficulties. So we just need to be prepared to face those difficulties. We need to be like the psalmist and instead of going maybe as far as he did, we need to kind of stop short and start remembering a little bit earlier, a little bit sooner. Uh, some things of God. It's good to remember. We remember, um, again, in the storm, they did get to the other side. We remember Titus chapter number 2, verse number 13. We remember our blessed hope, the Lord Jesus, what He said He would do. He said He would come back in the clouds and He would receive the church up to Himself. We'd be in those that are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up. Caught up with them that are asleep. Those that are dead before us will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And for you that are wondering what that is, that's called the rapture. The word rapture is not used to catching away. And it is before the tribulation, if anybody wants to argue, okay? 
Hallelujah. It's before, it's before the tribulation takes place. God's going to take His bride. Amen. He's going to protect His bride. His bride. This dispensation will end and the, the one of the tribulation will start and then the kingdom. So, but that's a whole other message. But we remember His song. We remember that our blessed hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is what the Bible says in Titus 2.13. We remember that we don't have to sorrow as others which have no hope. We remember. Now, verse 10. Verse 10. Look at verse 10 of 77. Psalm 77. Verse 10 says, And I said, This is my infirmity. This is my problem today. But, you ought to underline that. But, I will remember. I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I might be going through some trials today, but you know, I've had some good times too. I've had some wonderful times. You've had wonderful times. You've had bad times. Life is mixed with troubles and trials, happiness and joy, good times and bad times. In verse number 11 and 12 of Psalm 77, I will remember, I will meditate. I will remember, I will meditate on the works of the Lord. I'm going to remember, I'm going to begin to study. Remember what He has rescued us from and brought us to. I can remember that. I can, I can remember that. I can remember the day that I, come, I was completely satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ, resting in the sufficiency. Of, I remember that day. And I remember what brought it to pass. I remember searching the scriptures to find out if he was who he says he was. Find out who he was. I read John chapter number 4 and verse number 10 that says, If you knew the gift of God and who it was, you would have asked, and I would have given you the water of life freely. I found out who he was. I found out he's eternal God, is who Jesus Christ is. Never was a time he did not exist, never will be a time he will cease to exist. God became man, God in the flesh. He was in the garden with Adam. He was in creation. He spoke this world into existence. How do you know it was him? Because Colossians 1 says it was, in verse 15. Jesus is God. I understand who he is. Only God can forgive sin. And God became a man. He took upon him the... Uh, of the seed of Abraham, the form of man, and was made in the likeness of man, the Bible said in Philippians chapter 2, and he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. I know that. Why? But the Bible says, I remember these things. I remember that my sin debt was paid in full by the blood of Christ on Calvary. I know that for sure. I know that. And I know it's eternal. And I know that he was put in the ground and I know he rose again three days later because the Bible said so. Romans chapter 1 said he rose again to prove everything he said was true. Proving to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. I know that. I know these things. I remember them. You know what remembering these things does to me? It produces a calm that nobody else can ever bring. See, if you don't know Christ, you don't understand what I'm saying. You don't understand this calm. You're still, you still have that fear and that frightening. You don't have the power of a sound mind. You don't have it. But you can have it. Salvation is not limited. Salvation is not just for a few. Salvation is to all men that all may believe. Well, why did God do that for? Why did He create us knowing we're going to sin? I'm going to tell you what. He loved you. He didn't love us if we knew we were going to sin then create hell for the devil and his angels let you go. Let me tell you how much God loved you is He became a man and fixed it. Whatever the first Adam messed up, the second Adam fixed. And He gives you a choice. He does not go against your free will, but He will give you a choice to accept Him as Savior. Why? God wants somebody, wants people that will love him of their own volition instead of a forced love. He don't want a bunch of puppet on strings. He wants you to trust him as your Savior. I remember. I remember those things. I remember. I'm going to remember. And um, you can turn to Matthew 27. You can see the crucifixion. Several places you can see the crucifixion. I have to read it just every once in a while. I mean, I, I know it, but I purposely turn over there and read about the crucifixion. And it just takes me back to how much he loved me. He, he withstood the mocking. He said, if thou be the Son of God, come down. 
Remember those that mocked him and ridiculed him and sped upon him. But if thou, this, this statement here, if thou be the son of God, come down. You arrogant, you arrogant soul. That's what I want to tell that idiot for saying that. Those people, if thou be the son of God, you better, you better be glad he didn't come down. Amen. That he stayed there till the job was finished. That crowd should have been at the tomb saying, if thou be the son of God, come out. Amen. That's what they ought to have done. So we remember, I remember these things. So what are we going to do today? We're going to remember. We're going to remember the goodness of God. We know that God's word never fails. His character is always the same. Let me show you about his character. I've, I've been preaching this on Wednesday night. But turn over to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. Remember the questions the psalmist asked in Psalm 77, verse 7, 8, 9, 10. Will his mercy endure? Is he forsaken us? Is he, is he quit on us? In other words, God never goes against his character. The Bible tells us plainly in Hebrews 13, 5 that he will never leave us nor forsake us. But in Psalm chapter number 86 and verse number 15, we're looking at the attributes and the character of Almighty God. You will find that character mentioned back in Exodus 34. You'll find it in Numbers chapter number 14. These very same words. But Psalm 86 verse 15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. That's what kind of God we serve. That's His character. So if you're going through these trials of Psalm 77, let's remember who He is. So we can close right here today saying, Thank you, Lord. I really needed that today. I needed that today. And in Psalm 77 and verse number 20, the Bible said, Thou ledest my people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Thank you, Lord. I know you're on the job. I know you're leading. And I finally see that faith, my faith, faces difficulties but faith finds a solution as well. The solution is Christ. Let's stand our feet.